Move over Flipper Zero because there's a new tech darling in town. It's called Meshtastic and it promises to bring us an off-grid, decentralized comms network that's entirely open source and outside the control of Big Brother. Best of all, it runs for free on tiny, affordable, and low-powered radios sporting ESP32 microcontrollers. But besides looking really cool and getting me to empty my wallet, what can these things actually do? Well, think text-based walkie-talkies, enabling you to send encrypted messages over long-range radio, aka LoRa. This novel application shields your transmissions from potential wiretapping by big telecommunication companies, ensuring your messages remain confidential, and most importantly, yours. But it goes even deeper. There are a number of scenarios today where traditional cellular networks fail. For instance, urban festivals and gatherings where the cell network is saturated, like New Year's Eve in Times Square. Overlanding or other remote adventure activities in isolated areas like deserts. Also overseas traveling if you don't have roaming or a local sim. And NGO work in places without cell infrastructure. We'll also cover the most common pitfalls enthusiasts make and how to correct those. Finally, I'm taking this innovation to new heights, literally, by outfitting my drone with one of these groundbreaking devices to conduct an epic range test to see how far these things can actually go. By the end of this video, you'll thoroughly appreciate the unique freedom that these powerful mini mishtastic devices provide, and we'll find out ultimately if they're worth it. Welcome to the future of communication. This is the tiny and low power LoRa 32 board from Helltech, and it's a system on a chip designed to do only two things look cool and send encrypted messages over long range radio. So I ordered two of these from Amazon and grabbed two of the coolest cases I could find. In one LoRa 32 box, you'll get the following. One ESP32 LoRa OLED board V3, a LoRa antenna, and a 1.25 millimeter two pin cable. They sell them in pairs, presumably so you have someone to talk to. And your best bet is to grab these from Amazon or eBay. And I'll put links in the description below. However, the stock antenna on these things is not very good. I'd suggest upgrading to this whip antenna for improved signal. Now let's demystify the hardware real quick. This board is powered by the ESP32 S3 FN8 chip. It has a 1.25 millimeter battery connector, which will come in handy later as we test its portability. The socket type for the battery is SH1.25X2. It features a USB-C for flashing the firmware and providing power. There are two physical buttons on this board, the reset and user programming button. It also has two LEDs and a monochromatic OLED screen. If you want to use these on the move, you'll want to grab a battery. Be sure to get a 3.7 volt, 4.1 watt hour rechargeable battery with the correct polarities on the cable. While we're on the subject of power, you might be wondering what the battery life is for one of these devices, and it varies dramatically based on what functionality you're using. If you're testing the different capabilities and actively using everything, I think you can expect around 12 hours. But if you turn off the hungrier features and reduce send intervals and utilize the deep sleep settings, you can probably extend that quite a bit. For anyone looking to nest one of these outdoors permanently, you should be able to use solar to re-up the battery for those scenarios. And here is the power draw while idle, and here is the power draw while fairly active. Now, I noticed these really cool 3D printed cases on printable, but since I didn't want to deal with printing them, I went to the Muzi Works Lab Etsy store and bought two cases faster than you can say impulse buy. Simon was super helpful and even sent me some of my favorite kinds of batteries, the free kind. He also added a custom whip antenna upgrade. These cases are pretty much the Tesla of gadget housing. Sleek, smart, and probably too cool for me. I'll put the link for his store in the description below. But I also wanted to see if my PCB manufacturing buddies over at JLC could do anything with these schematics since they have commercial printing machinery. So I sent them the .stl files from Printable and they delivered in spades. They sent back this phantom black case featuring a nylon backstop and a super durable resin front face. Not bad, right? and these things have a nifty custom loop ring for tethers. Okay, so let's get our hardware situated in our new cases. A few things to note. Connecting a LoRa radio without an antenna can cause the transmitted energy to reflect back into the device, potentially damaging the radio's transmitter components due to overheating, so make sure the antenna is attached. These antennas snap into place like so. The LoRa 32 has two front-facing buttons. The left button cycles through the information displayed on the screen, and a long press of the left button will shut down the device. And the right button will reset the device. There are also two LEDs on the device. The blinking white LED will indicate that the device is on and awake, and the red LED will light up when it's charging. 
Okay, so now that the hardware is set up, we want to flash the Meshtastic firmware to our board. This familiar ESP32 based hardware means we can tap the usual suspects when it comes to programming. Dev environments like Arduino IDE, MicroPython, Espressive IDE should all be compatible. But I'd also note that Meshtastic, the open source software that enables much of this functionality, is built with the tool platform.io. And if you want to get your hands dirty or play around with further customization, you can download the Platform IO plugin for your favorite code editor. I use Cursor, which is a fork of VS Code that brings Gen AI to the party. But if you're just looking to flash the latest Meshtastic firmware to your LoRa device, you actually don't need any intermediary software. Okay, so the device doesn't come with the Meshtastic firmware. That's a separate organization, open source project. Um, historically, to get software onto your microcontrollers, you'd have to use something like Arduino or an IDE or something like that. And what's really cool is because of the new APIs that Chrome makes available to developers, you can actually connect to USB devices or USB serial devices as well as Bluetooth devices and things like that. So um, what Meshtastic has done is they've actually created an application, flasher.meshtastic.org, where you can get the Meshtastic firmware onto your device right through a Chromium-based browser. So this will work for Chrome, Edge, Brave, et cetera. So we just come over to flasher.meshtastic.org. We select our device, and then we select our firmware version. If you want something more stable, you can go here. I want the latest stuff, even though it might be a little buggy, so I'm gonna do the latest alpha, and then I'm gonna click flash. If you have previous installations, then you might wanna do full erase and install. If you wanna keep data from prior installations, just keep this unchecked, and that's what I'm gonna do here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and click update, and it shows all my devices that are connected um, on various serial ports. I am going to use this guy here. It does look like there's two entries. They're probably both gonna work, but I've had most success with slab underscore USB to UART. If nothing shows up here, you probably have a faulty USB cable. You need a USB cable that can do power and data. Uh, so we might wanna cycle through a couple cables until um, your device shows up. So I'm gonna do connect. And then I'm gonna just, um, well, it actually automatically starts updating. And it'll take a couple minutes. If you don't see this going, it probably lost a connection. Again, the connection is usually the biggest issue, the cable. So you might wanna try a couple different adapters, a couple different cables, et cetera, until you get it working. Okay, and then this stuff's gonna keep logging. We can just go ahead and unplug and we will be all set. Okay, so you need to run a client with your LoRa device. So there's always a pair. Uh, the LoRa device sends the messages using the radio, it gets on the Meshtastic network, but your client is how you set up the configuration, it's how you type out the messages, it's how you receive the messages in many cases. Um, so you can use the Android app, the iOS app, Chromium-based web browser, uh, Python CLI, and they even have Linux support now. Uh, the iPhone app is much better than the Android app, so that's what I'm going to use. So I'm just going to go to the App Store and you can search for Meshtastic, you will find the app here. I'm gonna go ahead and download it. Let's open that up. And then we're gonna start giving it permissions. We do want it to have GPS access. We do want it to have Bluetooth access and no on the notifications. So the device name is gonna be Meshtastic underscore and then it's gonna be a four character truncated version of the hash ID, just so you know which device you're working with. Um, and uh, if you've connected and reconnected, then you might have to go into your Bluetooth settings and forget the device uh, in order to reconnect. But I think I'm gonna be good here. So, you know, 84EC is my hash. It says it right here, 84EC. So I know that's the right device. I'm gonna go ahead and select it. And now it's going to ask me to pair it. It's gonna flash a unique code, 998389. And we're gonna pair it once. Uh, you only have to do that one time. You will have to keep connecting in the future, but you only have to do that formal pairing once. Okay, much better. So now we want to configure it, and man, there are a lot of settings, uh, but we definitely want to give it a region. So I just select, um, you can go to config, and then you can go to LoRa, and then right here there's going to be this region section. We definitely want to do United States. Um, and let's go ahead and save that. Now what happens here is when you make configuration changes, uh, you have to save and it will reboot the device in many cases. So like I just set United States, I'm gonna go ahead and click save and it's look, watch the device reboot, see? And then when it reboots, I'm gonna have to reconnect to it. So let's watch that happen here. 
And it should, I think, automatically reconnect. Yep, there it goes. And look, it has a region now. So now uh, we are paired, right? And so you have your messaging section here where you can do direct messages with other devices that are picked up. You have your pairing. Uh, th this is using Bluetooth. It could use Wi-Fi. I can't use both at the same time, that is. Um, you have other nodes. You have a mesh map, but you also have the configuration settings here. So there's a lot you can do with it. Um, this guy does not have a GPS, but what you might want to do is uh, you can use your phone's GPS. So like if you go to app settings, you can select the share location, location, use your phone's GPS to provide a location to your node. I just think that's useful because when you have multiple nodes, um, you can see how far away they are. I'm gonna go ahead and do share location. Um, you can set the interval and all that stuff. But, uh, okay, so now it's sharing the location. Um, let's go down to user. Uh, we can give it a nice name. So let's go in here. So I'm gonna call it, um, I'm gonna call it Data Slayer Black. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and save that. Again, it's probably gonna reboot. Uh, but then it's going to have a, a more true name. Um, okay, and then, so like, look, if I go over here, yeah, Data Slayer Black. Um, and other devices will be able to see that name. So I actually have a bunch of other devices in my vicinity. I'm in Miami here, so uh, it just automatically picks up those devices. Um, but let's go back to settings here. Let's go to display. Um, I'm going to turn on this always point north on the compass. Um, display units, I'm going to go to Imperial, don't hate me. And like now we can see it's going to be used miles and feet when it's talking about distances. Okay, and I do want to show you the web client real quick. So the gist of this is instead of using the native app on your phone as the client, you can use your computer's browser, your cr computer's Chrome-based browser. So I, if I open up Chrome here and I go to uh, client.meshtastic.org, um, this is a remote a hosted application, but what it does is it connects to local devices. The presumption here is that your computer has either Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, and your Meshtastic device is either emitting from Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. I'm going to use Bluetooth here. You can see it's enabled right over here. And so what you have to do is you have to connect, and we can go over to Bluetooth here. And again, it can give you Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, USB serial if you want to plug it in. You just do new device. It's going to search for devices here. Okay, so I found one of my Meshtastic devices. I'm gonna go ahead and click pair. So let's see. Oh, and then I just click on it here. Okay, and there it goes. And so, you know, it's basically the same as the native app. Um, you, can, you can modify the configurations. You can send your messages. So like, for instance, if I go over to config, these are the basic device configurations. And then they call uh, these extra modules like MQTT and the range test. Uh, they call this uh, module configurations. Okay, so this is how these things work. Each of the Meshtastic devices should be connected to a client. And it can be connected to a client over Bluetooth, USB serial, or Wi-Fi. I usually use Bluetooth. So, you know, if, if these two individuals were, say, hiking together and they diverged, it's okay if they don't have cellular service anymore or satellite or internet or GPS or anything like that, as long as they have a close proximity uh, Wi-Fi capability or a close proximity Bluetooth capability and can connect to this, this will, these will do the heavy lifting of sending the messages several miles in some cases uh, using LoRa. And so let's send some messages real quick within close proximity. So if I open up my phone here, and I go over to Meshtastic. Um, let's see here. Okay, so I'm going. So let me turn this on first, and then the radio should connect. And then, okay, there it goes. And I'm going to do the same thing over here. Okay, so um, both of them are connected. You see this node here. This is what this looks like when this is connected. So I'm gonna send a message from here to here and show you what happens. So again, you can't type on this thing, right? Um, so you come over here and you can create a channel that you can talk on, or you can send direct messages to 
uh, different nodes. So like if I wanted to send a message to Data Slayer Green, go to Direct Messages, kill that. All right, Data Slayer Green. And I can say, uh, yeah, so basically instantly that message came up here. So, okay, so that's, you know, I just sent a message from here to here, and then I could do the same thing over here. The app's not quite as good, but I can do ahoy. See, so it shows up on the app and it also shows up on the, um, shows up on the device here. Okay, so that's, that's sending messages. Um, and because we enabled uh, GPS, these things should be able to determine uh, where they are in relation to each other. So if I toggle through the available nodes here, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. See, Data Slayer Green, 159 feet away. Obviously, like the GPS isn't perfect, but as you move more significant distances, it will be able to get a good read there. And you'll see, I mean, in some cases, I was able to see it was three miles apart. Um, and then this, this compass thing here, uh, people have had issues with it. It uses something called dead reckoning. So basically if you're on the move and you have GPS enabled, then it will try to uh, determine where you are in relation to true north. And it also will give you a heading and it'll point to other nodes in some cases. Um, and again though, people have gotten varying degrees of utility out of, out of that. So if it's more confusing than it is helpful, you can just turn that off. Okay, something you're probably gonna wanna do is a range test. Technically, you could continually just send messages and then see when the messages stop sending and then that's your range. But the problem is um, when you're conducting the range test, uh, a lot of the messages won't get through. And so what the range test does is it will keep sending uh, new messages every specified interval, like 30 seconds or so, and it will um, increment a counter so you can kind of figure out from there, you know, what messages you're getting and which ones you're not getting, and you don't have to worry about keep sending messages, which gets annoying. So in order to do that, you need to enable range test on both devices, and then you would go your separate ways and you would see how far you can go um, while still getting messages. So the way you do that is you go to config, you go to uh, modules or settings, it's different based on what app you're using. You go to range test right here and you enable it. And then you can go to the interval and I'll do every 15 seconds. And then you just go ahead and save that. It's gonna reboot. And then you do the same thing on your other device. So if you go to radio configuration, range test, enable 15 seconds, and then that should reboot. And then it'll start sending messages with the prefix SEQ for sequence and then the counter, the increment. Okay, so I got my first message already, SEQ1, and we should just see SEQ2, right? And so what you can do is, as you get these messages, you can flip over to nodes. Like say I get a sequence three and I'm walking away, right? I can then go over to nodes and then I can go to the other, um, node that I'm that I'm working with here and I can actually uh, let's see okay it doesn't show the distance right there but it does right here see 200 feet away and I actually did a test like this where I put the um, I put one of them in the window in my building and my buildings you know fairly high and I went out to like an island that was like three and a half miles away and I actually got a message through at three and a half miles which was pretty cool you know line of sight is important but I will say, even in the urban area that I'm in, if I stayed within a mile, it would get messages even if there were like, you know, buildings in the way and things like that. So I'm not convinced that's the only thing that matters. Uh, but then beyond that, there's different uh, network pre presets, right? Like um, you could do different megahertz and some have higher data rates, some have lower data rates, higher distance, things like that. When it comes to the, um, the LoRa settings, the gist of uh, how it works is the trade-off is between uh, throughput, so like high data, and then distance. So something like Wi-Fi is uh, low distance, right? It's within the order of like 100 feet, but it's high data, high throughput. You can send a lot of information. What LoRa is, is it's low data, so you can't send you know, rich, uh, you know, heavy packets of data, but you can send them long distances. Um, so that's like the basic gist, but they're both radio waves. They use you know, the same technology essentially. But then from here, they give you other presets. 
and they try to describe what the presets have. But at the end of the day, most people say to just use the default settings, long, fast. And the reason is because if you want to pick up on other nodes, they need to be on those same uh, frequencies, those same wavelengths. Okay, so one thing you might want to do is create your own encrypted channel. So let's go ahead and do that. So if you go to settings, and then you go to channels, and then you go to add channel, Private, private chat, default. All right, there it goes. And so, and then to get it onto my other device to get the private key over there, you go to settings, you go to share QR. I'm gonna kill all these. And then what I'm going to do is open up the camera over here, right? And then it's going to open up that local link. It's going to ask you to accept. And now private chat is here. So what I can do is I can say testing, send that through. Let's see. Okay, so it finally worked. So creating those private channels is um, a little tricky, but um, if you just test it out, I think you should be good. Let's see, yeah. Okay, and so what this channel is encrypted, right? So anyone who inter intercepts like the radio signal um, is only gonna get encrypted messages, um, encrypted um, data. So your communications are going to be private in those cases. Okay, so now for the range test, I conducted four distinct types of tests using a number of different settings and parameters and uh, locations, and I wanna talk about what worked best for me. So for the first test I did, I live on the 32nd floor of a high-rise building, and so what I did was, for one of the nodes, I uh, set it on my balcony, and um, I went out about 1,000 feet uh, with a direct line of sight, and for this test, I was using the default long fast uh, frequency, and I used one stub antenna and one whip antenna. And that worked pretty well. Those messages came through just fine. Okay, so for the second test I conducted, both of the nodes were at the beach, so they were both at ground level. There was really no prominence or elevation of either nodes. All right, so we have a connection right now. The connection is, it says 80%. We're gonna keep just sending messages until we no longer have uh, a connection, a signal. So let's go. Again, I was using the long fast frequency and I was using two stub antennas. And I was actually pretty surprised that I wasn't able to get any more than about 500 feet of distance before the messages stopped going through. So these stub antennas just aren't that great or they can be hit or miss. Okay, so for the third test I did, um, I did a direct line of sight test. We did about one mile. Okay, so we're gonna run a, um, a range test. We got node operator one right here. And I'm gonna be out there running the second node and we're gonna see what we get in terms of uh, connectivity so we'll see we were using long fast both devices were using the stub antenna but one of the devices i put on my drone and i elevated it to probably about a hundred feet again though uh, no signal was able to get through so i was pretty surprised by that because i had a direct line of sight and uh, these things are rated at those types of distances so i thought that would get through i attribute it to the uh, stub antenna okay so for the final test i put the first node in the window on the 32nd floor in my apartment so it was quite elevated had a good bit of prominence and i also put the whip antenna on that node uh, for better power but i also changed the preset i changed the frequency from long fast to very long slow. So the trade-off there is the data transmission is lower, the throughput is lower, but in theory, the distance might be greater. So I was on that um, different frequency. And then for the other node, uh, I, again, I used the stub antenna and I went out around uh, on a sort of peninsula near where I live. 
and I just let the range test keep going. And I got messages at a couple miles, but then I continued to get messages all the way up to about three and a half miles. So what I would just call out there is the first node had the whip antenna. It was elevated quite a bit on the 32nd floor, and it had basically a direct line of sight with no obstruction all the way out to where I was uh, three and a half miles away. Now, not every single message got through, so it wasn't like a perfect connectivity, but um, when the messages did get through, it caught up and sent all the messages that uh, didn't make it through. So uh, it was a true range test and it worked pretty well. Um, so, you know, I was pretty happy with that. What I think might help even more though is if on that second node, I also had a better antenna than just the stub antenna, I could probably get even more distance. So these things are probably not going to replace my phone provider, but it might be the start of something new. Imagine transforming the way we communicate by merging the simplicity of walkie-talkies with the power of modern technology. And that's exactly what these devices do. They're not just any communication tool, they are advanced text-based walkie-talkies that empower you to send encrypted messages over long distances using radio waves. This cutting edge feature bypasses the need for traditional telecom networks, shielding your transmissions from potential eavesdropping by big telecom companies. With these devices, you're not just communicating, you're taking a bold step towards privacy and freedom in your conversations. Whether you're coordinating with a team in remote locations or setting up a secure channel for personal communication, these devices offer a powerful alternative to conventional methods, ensuring your messages remain confidential, and again, most importantly, yours.